Today I'll be talking about visual design, theory, and research. I'll be using the following resources. Type and Image, Computers, Graphics, and Learning, Graphics for Learning, Visual Design Fundamentals, Creating Graphics for Learning and Performance, White Space is Not Your Enemy, and 100 Things Every Designer Needs to Know About People. First, we're going to talk about visual perception. The eyes see differently than a camera sees, and it's more than meets the eye. First of all, an eye uses half the brain's resources to operate. We selectively attend to and perceive meaning, not just based on what we see, but we use prior knowledge to guide our perception. We look for pattern recognition and we create visual analogies. It's our brains that see, not our eyes. Schema theory is one of the most interesting theories. It's the idea that there's some mental processing that is probably more metaphorical than it is physiological, and it represents an individual's entire organizational knowledge network. Based on the research he could find, Reber says this, Schema theory deals with bottom-up or isolated facts, as well as top-down analogies. For example, if it were bottom-up and we were walking along and saw a friend across the street, we might wave to him only to have him turn around and find out that it's the wrong person. However, with an analogy, students are given instruction in an area they're not familiar with. An analogy can provide a bridge where students are and where the instruction is going to take them. An example of an analogy might be to talk about how plants grow and use this to discuss child rearing. Next we'll look at encoding and retrieval. There are three processes that were discussed by Gagné in 1985. The first is elaboration, the idea that as we learn we add to what's already known. The second is the spread of activation we actually create a spatial map of all of the information that we have. Next is organization. We intentionally shape the information into meaningful parts. Another theory has to do with the idea of pattern recognition. Many of us have the ability to look at a scattered piece of dots and form them into something recognizable. For example, some people might take a look at this picture and see a dog in the middle of it. Can you? Next time you're out walking on the street, look around you and see if you can find disparate patterns and create some kind of image. Another principle is called a Gestalt principle. This is the idea of closure. Look carefully at this picture. What do you see? It's rather famous. It's the idea that some people see a young woman while others see a witch. Humans naturally look for meaning in everything they see, trying to connect it to what they already know. We match shapes and patterns based on this. Another Gestalt principle is called proximity, and the objects closer together will be grouped in a meaningful way. For example, here we see rows of dots. We don't see individual dots, but we see five rows of five dots. Similarity is also important. When we group similar objects, they are meaningful to us. So here we see a lonely cross surrounded by dots. It may remind us of a graveyard. Another Gestalt principle is called continuity. The mind looks for unity or continuity even when it's not there. For example, when we look at this picture, it appears to be a line going through a circle or an egg. But is that really so? Watch what happens. When we drop away the egg or the circle, actually it's two lines on either side of the circle. Grouping is another idea. Your brain receives about 40 million inputs each second. 
The brain takes shortcuts. The learner's eyes can misinterpret. So we design to influence what people see. We can use grouping, white space, and patterns to help us make meaning for learners. Here we see four words. Not very meaningful. Students could read them in any way. We can draw a box around them, but that doesn't help a lot. Watch this. Once we group them, all of a sudden we see stop war peace now. Or if we group another way, we see stop peace war now. So grouping can be very effective to help meaning. What happens with our visualization in short-term memory? There have been studies that look at how people read. For example, if we're trying to match a normal R with one that's reversed, can you tell which it is? How long does it take you? Is it this one? Is it this one? Or is it this one? Which one is actually the reverse? It's the last one. This study ask subjects to determine if a letter is normal although rotated or mirror reversed. The more the rotation, the more response time it takes. This provides evidence for visualization in short-term memory, that is the process of mental rotation. Dual coding theory hypothesizes that using two codes produces additive memory effects. Therefore, you should use both text and visuals. When we look at recall, we find something interesting. That we forget things over time. Even if we recall, say 70%, within one hour that drops. In a month's time or more, it drops considerably. How can we increase this recall? There's a theory called primacy effect and another theory called recency effect. This is the idea that things that you are told first, you remember best, and things that you are told last, you remember second best. Notice the curve and how it springs up at the end. The first principle of instructional graphics, according to Reber, is that there are times when pictures can aid learning, times when pictures do not aid learning but do no harm, and times when pictures do not aid learning and are distracting. We must be intentional and deliberate about what we do. So you have to ask yourself, what is the purpose of your graphic? Form and function is one idea. These are based on the learner's needs, the objectives, as well as the medium that you use. Graphics and photos and in instruction can be useful for the affective domain, for cosmetic purposes to make something pretty, for motivation to get people excited, as well as in the cognitive or motor domain to gain attention and to present information or demonstrate, as well as to practice. Some graphics are merely representational, so pictures that share a physical resemblance to the subject are called representational. We also have arbitrary graphics. These are pictures that share no physical similarity to the subject, illustrate logical or conceptual ideas visually. Then we also have abstract graphics. Some abstract concepts also have pictures or symbols associated with them. Here we have the Dove of Peace. Another type of graphic is one called analogical. Here we have a picture of a child and the idea is that landing a job would be child's play, but it's not as easy as you think. And so we have a child looking somewhat frustrated. So images show something else, but imply a similarity to the subject. And we have three kinds of those. Analogies, 
similes, and metaphors. I suggest you go to the web and look these up to find out what the differences are. Aesthetics. Learners prefer things that are aesthetically pleasing, even when graphics usually do not directly contribute to learning. But care should be taken graphics do not interfere with other graphics for cognitive functions. Tell me, is this cosmetic or meaningful? Read the passage and watch for the image. If you said cosmetic, you would be correct. However, if I add a clock, now we have a simile for time standing still, and this becomes meaningful. Graphics can supply a motivational function. They can help you maintain motivation. They can create novelty and curiosity. They can also be a long-term motivational tool. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of empirical support for this. They can also create an attention-gaining function. We can use animation for this, and it helps contrast to a static background. It helps to amplify or emphasize. We also create an illusion. Static graphics can be moderate to heavy in the richness of detail. We also have a presentation demonstration function for images. Here's one that shows you how a factory works. We can also use it for an organizational function as well as a practice function. But graphics must be congruent and relevant. What are these graphics doing here? If pictures are not congruent or relevant to the text, they may be distracting and interfere with learning. Generalizability. Research is largely based on the effect of pictures on learning from prose. Be sure that the learner can read and understand the text and the graphic. Mental images. Prompting learners to image internally can produce learning effects. It has long been known that athletes use imaging to help see themselves as successful. Adults are more likely to form internal images spontaneously than children. Realism. Too much or too little realism can interfere. Here is an opportunity to use a graphic image rather than a photograph. Detail. Too much or too little detail can actually interfere. If we just take out the microscope, it makes it much more clear if we're trying to learn the parts. A review of visual theory. Behavioral and cognitive theories say graphics can aid learning, but they can also interfere with learning. The behavioral principle of least effort says that learners may divert their attention inappropriately. Cognitive information processing theory says that visuals will help in attending to, encoding, and retrieval. Dual coding, allowing us to have verbal and visual tracks, actually may produce additive effects and retrieval may be doubled. Theories of motivation state that the learning environment is relevant and perceived to be satisfying when using images. There is an increase in intrinsic and extrinsic motivation in terms of curiosity, optimizing challenge, and encouraging imagination. That's all for now. 